It had all depended on the man's accuracy. Nash had said that Bond would get one bullet through the heart. Bond had taken the gamble that Nash's aim was as good as he said it was. And it had been. Bond lay like a dead man lies. Before the bullet he had recalled the corpses he had seen, how their bodies had looked in death. Now he lay totally collapsed like a broken doll, his arms and legs carefully outflung. He explored his sensations. Where the bullet had crashed into the book, his ribs were on fire. The bullet must have gone through the cigarette case and then through the other half of the book. He could feel the hot lead over his heart. It felt as if it was burning inside his ribs. It was only a sharp pain in his head where it had hit the woodwork and the violet sheen on the scuffed toe caps against his nose that said he wasn't dead. Like an archaeologist, Bond explored the carefully planned ruin of his body. The position of the sprawled feet, the angle of the half-bent knee that would give purchase when it was needed. The right hand that seemed to be clawing at his pierced heart was within inches when he could release the book of the little attaché case, within inches of the lateral stitching that held the flat-bladed throwing knives, two-edged, sharp as razors, that he had mocked when Q Branch had demonstrated the catch that held them. And his left hand, outflung in the surrender of death, rested on the floor and would provide upward leverage when the moment came. Above him there sounded a long, cavernous yawn. The brown toe caps shifted. Bond watched the shoe leather strain as Nash stood up. In a minute, with Bond's gun in his right hand, Nash would climb onto the bottom bunk and reach up and feel through the curtain of hair for the base of the girl's neck. Then the snout of the beretta would nuzzle in after the probing fingers. Nash would press the trigger. The roar of the train would cover the muffled boom. It would be a near thing. Bond desperately tried to remember a simple anatomy. Where were the mortal places in the lower body of a man? Where did the main artery run, the femoral, down the inside of the thigh? And the external iliac, or whatever it was called, that became the femoral? Across the centre of the groin? If he missed both, it would be bad. Bond had no illusions about being able to beat this terrific man in unarmed combat. The first violent stab of his knife had to be decisive. The brown toe caps moved. They pointed towards the bunk. What was the man doing? There was no sound except the hollow iron clang as the great train tore through the Simplon, through the heart of the Vasenhorn and Monte Leone. The tooth glass tinkled. The woodwork creaked comfortably. For a hundred yards on both sides of the little death cell, Rows of people were sleeping, or lying awake, thinking of their lives and loves, making little plans, wondering who would meet them at the Gare de Lyon. And all the while, just along the corridor, death was riding with them down the same dark hole, behind the same great diesel on the same hot rails. One brown shoe left the floor. It would have stepped half across Bond. The vulnerable arch would be open above Bond's head. Bond's muscles coiled like a snake's. His right hand flickered a few centimetres to the hard stitching on the edge of the case, pressed sideways, felt the narrow shaft of the knife, drew it softly halfway out without moving his arm. The brown heel lifted off the ground, the toe bent and took the weight. Now the second foot had gone. Softly move the weight here, Take the purchase there. Grasp the knife hard so that it wouldn't turn on a bone. And Then in one violent corkscrew of motion, Bond's body twisted up from the floor. The knife flashed, the fist with the long steel finger, and all Bond's arm and shoulder behind it lunged upwards. Bond's knuckles felt flannel. He held the knife in, forcing it in further. A ghastly, wailing cry came down to him. The beretta clattered to the floor. Then the knife was wrenched from Bronze's hand as a man gave convulsive twist and crashed down. Bond had planned for the fall, but as he sidestepped towards the window, a flailing hand caught him, sent him thudding onto the lower bunk. Before he could recover himself, up from the floor rose the terrible face, its eyes 
shining violet, the violet teeth bared. Slowly, agonizingly, the two huge hands groped for him. Bond, half on his back, kicked out blindly. His shoe connected, but then his foot was held and twisted, and he felt himself slipping downwards. Bond's fingers scrabbled for a hole in the stuff of the bunk. Now the other hand had him by the thigh, nails dug into him. Bond's body was being twisted and pulled down. Soon the teeth would be at him. Bond hammered out with his free leg. It made no difference. He was going. Suddenly, Bond's scrabbling fingers felt something hard. The book. How did one work the thing? Which way was it? Would it shoot him or Nash? Desperately, Bond held it out towards the great sweating face. He pressed at the base of the clock spine. Click. Bond felt the recoil. Click, click. Click, click. Now Bond felt the heat under his fingers. The hands on his legs were going limp. The glistening face was drawing back. A noise came from the throat, a terrible gargling noise. Then with a slither and a crack, the body fell forward onto the floor and the head crashed back against the woodwork. Bond lay and panted through his clenched teeth. He stared up at the violet light above the door. He noticed that the loop of the filament waxed and waned. It crossed his mind that the dynamo under the carriage must be defective. He blinked his eyes to focus the light more closely. The sweat ran into them and stung. He lay still, doing nothing about it. The galloping boom of the train began to change. It sounded hollower. With a final echoing roar, the Orient Express sped out into the moonlight and slackened speed. Bond lazily reached up and pulled at the edge of the blind. He saw warehouses and sidings. Lights shone brightly, cleanly on the rails. Good, powerful lights, the lights of Switzerland. The train slid quietly to a stop. In the steady, singing silence, a small noise came up from the floor. Bond cursed himself for not having made certain. He quickly bent down, listening. He held the book forward at the ready, just in case. No movement. Bond reached and felt for the jugular vein. No pulse. The man was quite dead. The corpse had been settling. Bond sat back and waited impatiently for the train to move again. There was a lot to be done. Even before he could see to Tatiana, there'd have to be the cleaning up. With a jerk, the long express started, softly rolling. Soon the train would be slaloming fast down through the foothills of the Alps into the Canton Valley. Already there was a new sound in the wheels, a hurrying lilt, as if they were glad the tunnel was past. Bond got to his feet and stepped over the sprawling legs of the dead man and turned on the top light. What a shambles! The place looked like a butcher's shop. How much blood did a body contain? Well, he remembered. Ten pints. Well, it would soon all be there. As long as it didn't spread into the passage. Bond stripped the bedclothes off the bottom bunk and set to work. At last, the job was done. The walls swapped down around the covered bulk on the floor, the suitcases ready for the getaway to Dijon. Bond drank down a whole carafe of water. Then he stepped up and gently shook the shoulder of fur. There was no response. Had the man lied? Had he killed her with the poison? Bond thrust his hand in against her neck. It was warm. Bond felt for the lobe of an ear and pinched it hard. The girl stirred sluggishly and moaned. Again Bond pinched the ear and again, at last, a muffled voice said, Don't! Bond smiled. He shook her. He went on shaking until Tatiana slowly returned, turned over on her side. Two doped blue eyes gazed into his and closed again. What is it? The voice was sleepily angry. Bond talked to her and bullied her and cursed her. He shook her more roughly. At last she sat up. She gazed vacantly at him. Bond pulled her legs out so that they hung down over the edge. Somehow he manhandled her down onto the bottom bunk. Tatiana looked terrible. The slack mouth, the upturned, sleep-drunk eyes, the tangle of damp hair. Bond got to work with a wet towel and her comb. 
La Seine came, and an hour later the French frontier at Valorbe. Bond left Tatiana and went out and stood in the corridor just in case, but the customs and passport men brushed past him to the conductor's cabin, and after five inscrutable minutes went on down the train. Bond stepped back into the compartment. Tatiana was asleep again. Bond looked at Nash's watch, which was now on his own wrist. 4.30. Another hour to Dijon. Bond set to work. At last, Tatiana's eyes opened wide. Her pupils were more or less centred. She said, Stop it now, James. She closed her eyes again. Bond wiped the sweat off his face. He took the bags, one by one, to the end of the corridor and piled them against the exit. Then he went along to the conductor and told him that Madame was not well and that they would be leaving the train at Dijon. Bond gave the conductor a final tip. Do not derange yourself, he said. I have taken the luggage out so as not to disturb Madame. My friend, the one with the fair hair, is a doctor. He's been sitting up with us all night. I've put him to sleep in my bunk. The man was exhausted. It would not be kind to waken him until ten minutes before Paris. Certainement, monsieur, the conductor had not been showered with money like this since the good days of travelling millionaires. He handed over Bond's passport and tickets. The train began to slacken speed. Voilà que nous y sommes. Bond went back to the compartment. He dragged Tatiana to her feet and out into the corridor and shut the door on the white pile of death in, beside the bunk. At last they were down the steps and onto the hard, wonderful, motionless platform. A blue smocked porter took their luggage. The sun was beginning to rise. At that hour of the morning there were very few passengers awake. Only a handful in the third class, who had ridden hard through the night, saw a young man help a young girl away from the dusty carriage with the romantic names on its side, towards the drab door that said, Sortie. 